Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, let me holler at y'all for a few minutes, actually. Uh, I don't want to be on here too long, um, but what I really want to do is I want to first address um, Marianne Williamson because she is actually the first candidate that I've ever given money to. Now, um, I'm not as political as I used to be because it hasn't been anybody worth voting for. Um, doesn't mean I haven't voted. I think um, uh, uh, whoever the independent or uh, candidate was in the last election is who I voted for. Um, and this election, put aside Kamala Harris, because whatever she's representing is, you know, it, it's really sad, and Cory Booker, that you can't get any one of those candidates candidates to speak or say anything specifically about reparations for black people unless somebody brings it up. So the first thing I jumped out at me was Marianne Williamson's courage. And a lot of people think this is something that she's just thought of. Marianne Williamson has been talking about reparations a long time. Okay, this is just not something that she's just started talking about. Um, you know, again, and, and she's the author of a few books. Just come on, Oprah, back in the day. But but before we get uh, into that, I got, I wanted to say I did. I said, and I suggest, and I encourage everybody that's ADOS to at least I think the minimum is you can donate is three dollars. Um, just to keep the conversation of reparations alive. Because nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is even going to keep it on the table at these debates. And at least I feel that if we keep Marianne Williamson in the debates, she ain't going nowhere. And every time they call on her and every time she opens up her mouth, you know she's going to represent for reparations. And my take on it is... I think that's more valuable than any Kamala Harris or any Cory Booker um, in this well, political race. Otherwise, it's not very exciting. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Democratic Party, like I said before, it needs a whole different, uh, it needs a revolution. It needs to be torn down and rebuilt. And if you're not willing to represent the party of the, be the party of the people that you should be, like representing real people and not all these corporate uh, uh, entities, then I don't really care about the Democratic Party because they are, they are flaky. And anybody that doesn't see that is flaky too. They need to be, the old guard needs to be pushed out because they're in bed with the same corporations that the Republicans are in bed with. And this formula that we have been using, uh, greed is too much. What is it? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. These people have gone too far. They've gotten too much money. They're too corrupt. That's why they don't want to hear um, or take offense to people like uh, uh, Ilhan Omar. Or, uh, you know, uh, you know who? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Rashida Tlaib, uh, Ayanna Presley. They don't want to talk to anybody that can say anything different because that old guard is what's keeping us miserable. Now, some people think that's too far to the left. Well, Nancy Pelosi and... Um, and I don't want to sound like I'm aging, folks, but at this point, I know how it is dealing with my uh, older uncles and things like that near in their 70s. They don't need to be doing it. There's a certain amount of time, I think, that you use the elders for counsel. Not up in there making those choices that they don't ever want to go from and too stubborn and setting their ways to hear anything other than um, themselves. See, I believe in letting the young people talk. Let, let me listen to what they have to say. 
and then give an opinion. Um, say, yeah, you know, that's a very good idea, but how about you try curving it this way as well? What do you what do you think about that? See, this is why you use guidance in terms of what the what your elders should be. These elders we got up here in the White House, they need to get going and um re overhaul the um, Democratic Party. And I just want to bring this up because, like I said, Marion Williamson is the only person that's keeping the conversation even on the table. And I want to read to you what is taken from her website. Race relations remains one of the greatest problems facing our country today. In this, as with every other issue, a core principle of Williamson's presidency will be solving problems by addressing their underlying causes. America cannot have the future that we wish for ourselves and for our children unless we're willing to clean up issues left over from the past. I do not believe the average American is racist, but I believe that the American, the average American is undereducated about the history of race in America. When our history is viewed through the clear through a clear lens, historically, economically and morally, White America is seen owing a debt to the descendants of slaves. That is why I support and I have a plan for a program of reparations to the descendants of American slaves. Slavery existed in America from 1619 until 1865. That was followed by another hundred years of institutional violence against black in the form of black code laws, segregation, lynching, Ku Klux Klan, and other forms of private and public horror. All in all, there were 350 years of institutional violence committed against a group of people who had brought to this country, who have been brought to this country against their will and then sold as slaves for purposes of building and American con the American economy. At the same time, when slaves were first emancipated at the end of the Civil War, there are estimated to have been between four to five million enslaved persons in the American South. General Tecusum, Tecusum, Tecuse Sherman promised to every former slave, family of four, 40 acres and a mule. While this would have provided a way to make a living to feed one's family, integrating economically into life as a free citizen, only a few actually received that average. And among those who received it, most of it had been taken away. As Martin Luther King Jr. would ask a hundred years later, they were freed, but what were they freed for? It was a full hundred years after the end of the Civil War, before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964 to dismantle segregation, and only in 1865 did the Voting Acts ensure equal access to black people at the voting poll. Right, did, did you hear what I said? Did you hear how many years later? Okay. The issue of the economic gap that existed at the end of the Civil War, however, was never addressed beyond Sherman's promise, and the gap has never been closed. I have advocated for broad-scale reparations for slavery since the 90s, and was the first candidate in this presidential primary season to make it the pillar, make it a pillar of my campaign. The issue of reparations is not a fringe notion. Germany has paid over 98 billion to Jewish organizations since the end of World War II. And while they do not erase the horrors of the Holocaust, reparations have gone far towards establishing reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe. Similarly, in 1988, Ronald Reagan assigned American Civil Liberties Act, assigning between 20,000 to 22,000 to surviving prisoners of the Japanese internment camps during the World War II. The idea that was 
of people which had been wronged by another people should then pay an economic restitution as payment of that wrong. And that's a civilized notion long considered to be reasonable. 